Hello. I want to talk a little bit about Civil War mail because I find it really interesting and there's a, many different ways you can collect Civil War mail. One part that I'm going to talk about today is prisoner of war mail. When the Civil War started and in the spring uh, shots were fired at Fort Sumter, mail service still continued between the North and the South until about June uh, when both sides stopped delivering mail through the lines. And so then there essentially was no mail between the uh, Union and the Confederacy until the uh, so there was no mail between the Union and the Confederacy for quite a few months and except for when prisoners were captured and put in prison of war camps. These prisoners, um, hundreds of thousands of soldiers were captured at different times and they would eventually be traded back and forth and uh, pardoned. Um, but prison camps were set up in Elmira, New York and in Ohio and Confederates were, uh, were moved to those prisons and they were allowed to write home. And so uh, here's a couple of letters or envelopes, covers, that I think are really neat. So here's a prisoner's letter, has a hand stamp prisoner's letter examined for Delaware, Delaware. And then it's postmarked Delaware City and it's addressed to Alexandria, is that North Carolina? Or is it Virginia? Virginia. Virginia. Okay. So this cover would have been mailed, this cover held a letter from a Confederate soldier, and he's probably writing home to Alexandria, Virginia, and he was in a camp at Fort Delaware in Delaware, and so it's got the Union stamp on it and postmarked Delaware City. I'm confused now. That uh, So how did this get delivered into the Confederacy? Maybe Alexandria was in Union control by then? Or it could have had the outer envelope. Well, this would be the outer because it has the Union stamp. So there might have been an inner envelope. I don't know whether any of those things were ever saved. Why don't you stop it for a second? <laughs> so during the Civil War, soldiers were captured and the North moved a lot of the Confederate soldiers uh, to prison camps. And some one was in Elmira, New York, which isn't too far from Camden. And then there was a big one in Ohio. Uh, called uh, in Sandusky, Ohio. What was that called? Johnson's Island. And you, t you should say Camden, which is where near Mystic is. Oh, okay. okay. So during the Civil War, soldiers were captured and they're oftentimes moved to prison camps. And so there, for example, there's a prison camp in Elmira, New York, which is not too far from Camden, New York, where Mystic is located. So that's interesting. The prison camp's no longer there. Uh, but it's interesting at a time when transportation was so challenging that the government would move these soldiers so far from the enemy lines. I've got two covers here from an Ohio prison camp, Johnson's Island, and it was actually an island in a river in uh, Sandusky. And so this cover was a prisoner uh, sent a letter to a reverend in Kentucky. and. It did not go through the Confederate lines, and so it was all the U.S. mail service. Uh, but it's still a prisoner that I'm sure life was very difficult, uh, and he's taking time to uh, communicate. This stuff is really fun history. This cover, also from Sandusky, did go through the lines. Yeah, I'm just disjointed. I'm not explaining it. I'm sorry. Uh, anyways, this is a cover from uh, Sandusky, Ohio and this uh, soldier is sending it to a woman in Mississippi. And so maybe it was his mother, maybe his wife. And it says, Flag of Truce via Fortress Monroe. And it has a U.S. stamp on it. It's been canceled in Ohio. And then due 10 cents. And the 10 cents would have been the Confederate postage that was due. So this cover would have gone through censors been trans, uh, it would have uh, gone to uh, Fortress Monroe, which was in Virginia, in the river between Virginia and Maryland, and under flag of truce would have been 
uh, transferred to the Confederacy. The Confederates uh, accepted it, and then it entered the Confederate mail system, and uh, this uh, person in Mississippi had to pay 10 cents to get the letter uh, from their, you know, son, husband. Some letters, here's a letter from the south to the north, and it says, citizen prisoner's letter per flag of truce. And so there's no Confederate postage stamp on it, so I don't know if it fell off or there might have been another envelope. The government required the, um, yeah. Um, I thought it would be more fun to uh, talk about these things, but I'm not giving him the backstory, so I'm not going to talk about that. Here's one of my favorite covers. This cover should not exist. You can see that it has a Confederate stamp and a Union stamp on it. And so the Postal Service, no, um, the government, uh, the U.S. government did not recognize the Confederacy as a legitimate government. They said that the Confederacy was still part of the Union, and it was just states that broke away. And they were concerned that if they it allowed Confederate stamps to be used with Union stamps, that that was recognizing the fact the Confederacy existed as a government able to issue stamps. So if you're a prisoner of war and you're sending a letter crossing the lines, the you had to have two envelopes. And so if I was in a prison camp in the U.S., I would uh, write my mother in Mississippi. I would put an outer envelope and address the letter and put a three cent U.S. stamp on to pay the U.S. postage. And then inside I had a separate envelope with, that held the letter and that would have to have Confederate postage. Well, sometimes people only had one envelope and they put both stamps on the same envelope. And I think that's fascinating that two governments that are at war with each other to have both of their stamps on the same envelope. And you can look at this, it says prisoner's letter, it was examined, it's going to South Carolina, flag of truce. Uh, the stamps are kind of beat up, but it's really neat to think that a uh, prisoner was writing home and how important this communication was, I'm sure, both for the prisoner and for the um, recipient. How about I read your stuff and see how that goes? All right, and, and you know, you don't, you can pause, you know what I mean? You don't have, the, you're not on, the camera's just yeah. if, you know, the audio is what... Prisoner mail was vital to people living throughout the Civil War. Prisoner mail was vital to people living through the Civil War. Imagine, most of the men went off to battle that had never traveled more than a few miles from home. They now found themselves captive in a strange land, guarded by the enemy. At home, their families tried to survive without them, often while the battles raged nearby and enemy troops seized their crops and livestock. Flag of truce covers also show us how each side faced its challenges with the nation split in half. The stamps and markings on Civil War covers open a window into the past. Sometimes the covers might even contain the original correspondence, which is a treat for all collectors. Mail moved from the north to the south by the way of flag of truce, and that means an agreement had been made to cease hostilities temporarily. When the number of POWs grew, flag of truce routes were set up across military lines so mail could be sent to and from the prison camps. Officially, the flag of truce mail had a slow start. The federal government didn't want to recognize the Confederacy as a legitimate government, so they refused to set up formal exchanges of prisoners or mail for over a year. Five months after the war began, two opposing generals stationed in Virginia finally worked out an informal exchange. The two generals agreed to exchange prisoners' mail under a flag of truce in September 1861. Why are so many Fort Monroe covers? No. Why does Fort Monroe figure prominently into the flag of truce mail? The generals were stationed in Virginia, and that was the site of many Civil War battles. The coastal region was ideal for flag of truce exchanges. Norfolk, which was under Confederate control, had good rail connections to Richmond, and across the Chesapeake Bay was Fort Monroe, which was controlled by the Union. Next to Fort Monroe was the Old Point Comfort 
post office, which had good access to Washington, D.C. by water. So the connection by steamship up the Chesapeake Bay turned into the main flag of truce route. How did flag of truce mail work? To send a letter by flag of truce, you placed your letter inside an envelope addressed to the recipient. Postage stamps or coins paid the rate to pay the rate were added. Postage stamps or coins to pay the rate were added. The envelope was then placed inside another envelope addressed to the exchange point and franked with the additional postage. So if you were being held in a northern prison sending a letter to the Confederacy, the outer envelope would have the U.S. stamp and the inner cover would have a Confederate stamp. At the delivery point, the outer envelope was opened and examined by authorities. If it passed, the letter was sealed inside the inner envelope and forwarded to the recipient. So inner envelopes only show the frankings and markings from the enemy's side of the postal service system. Was flag of truce mail censored? Flag of truce mail was inspected. The contents were limited to domestic ma matters, nothing about military actions. Failure to abide by the regulation meant your letter would be sent to the dead letter office. Because prisoners were desperate to communicate, their letters often asked recipients to write often, but warned them not to violate that regulation. Did civilians send mail by flag of truce? Flag of truce routes weren't intended for civilian use, but a small amount did get through. They were probably from acquaintances of the officers in charge. When did the opposing governments establish a system for exchanging mail? The war raged for over a year before the prisons began filling and officials realized they needed a formal system for exchanging prisoners and mail. In July 1862, the North and South reached an agreement, but exchanging prisoners virtually emptied the prisons, so the need for flag of truce mail stopped. It was ordered to stop less than two months after it began. What happened next? In return for being exchanged, Confederate POWs were required to promise not to fight the Union again. Convinced this wasn't working, the Union stopped most exchanges in June 1863, and prison populations soared again, so flag of truce mail resumed and continued until the end of the war. Additional exchange points were set up, but southeastern Virginia remained the principal location. What should collectors keep in mind when looking for flag of truce covers? All flag of truce mail is valued by collectors because they're important pieces of our heritage. There are some, but there are some covers that are especially desirable. For instance, regulations weren't always followed. The formal system called for the enemy's nation stamp on the outer envelope and the prisoner's home country's stamp on the inner cover to pay the rate for the last leg of the journey. But we now know that covers from with both stamps are tied together by the postmark. But we know from covers where both stamps were tied together by postmarks that this didn't always happen. Those covers are very sought after. Generally speaking, letters from prisoners are more common than letters written to them. But collectors prefer outbound letters from POWs. Mail from Confederate prisons is scarcer than mail from northern prisons, probably because southern authorities limited the amount of mail. Covers bearing the original correspondence are especially prized. Yeah, I guess the reason why the letters from prisoners are more common than letters written to them is you're in the prison. So, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. Probably a lot of them.